Matt Schaff and Jared Smola of DraftSharks.com here to get you ready for your week eight waiver wire runs. And Jared, week seven was not a good time to be a star receiver in the NFL. And that makes week eight a pretty good time to be a fill-in wide receiver. We're going to run through some key guys that are getting opportunities off of injuries to their teammates and, you know, try to sort out which situations might actually give us usable fantasy upside before i say anybody's name let me ask you do you mm-hmm. have a favorite wide receiver target this week on waivers and you know it could be the guy with the highest ceiling or it could be a guy that you think is going to be yeah. a specific value who's your favorite well i think the most interesting situation is the 49ers guys we know how efficient this passing game is we've already seen Jawan jennings have a weak winning performance this season when uh, Debo Samuel missed a game. We know Brandon Ayuk is out for the season with his knee injury. Debo Samuel in the hospital with pneumonia right now. I don't I don't know like if he's going to play this week, the following week. I don't know. It's pneumonia. I, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm kind of hoping to get some info on that. And then even, you know, George Kittle has a sprained foot. So this offense is all sorts of beat up. There's opportunity here. Jawan Jennings, he also missed last week with a hip injury. So we'll have to see about that. So it's Jawan Jennings and Ricky Pearsall, I think, are I think they're both worth adding in most fantasy leagues right now. I think Juwan Jennings, when healthy, is the guy who is the more immediate impact player just because he has four years of experience in this offense. But Pearsall is interesting. I mean, he is a first-round rookie. Ended up playing 48 snaps last week. I'm sure the Niners did not want him playing that much, but he had to because of the Ayuk injury, because Debo Samuel ended up not playing much at all with his issue. And to me, Pearsall looked fine. Like He didn't look like a guy who was shot two months ago or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so Pearsall, I think by the time we get to the end of the season, he might be the guy who, you know, is ahead of Jennings in our um, weekly rankings. So I guess it kind of depends what you need. Maybe like if you need more immediate help, I do think it's Jennings, but if you're looking more for a stash, someone that, you know, could be a difference maker into the fantasy playoffs, I might lean towards Ricky Pearsall. And I mean, it's San Francisco. So everybody who gets onto the field is a threat to do something. You know, you mentioned Juwan Jennings had that monster game against the Rams. He also, the week after that had three catches for 88 yards, even with with Debo, Ayuk, and George Kittle all playing in that game. So the Niners like him. They extended him after having drafted Ricky Pearsall and Jacob Cowing. You know, you mentioned that he's coming off the hip injury, so we're going to have to watch him this week to see what his availability is. The other issue with him is how available he is in fantasy leagues. He's 46% rostered already on ESPN, 44% on CBS, more available on Sleeper and Yahoo. The other question is how much you're going to have to pay. We don't know, but he's probably going to be the highest priced receiver on waivers this week, unless people are scared off by the hip injury. If that's the case, maybe you can get him for cheap. But I think Ricky Pearsall is at the very least a good alternative. So if you're putting in bids for both and you miss out on Jennings because he's too expensive, then Pearsall's probably going to come more cheaply. Made his debut last week, led the team in routes because they ran out of pass catchers. I think it's also telling what the team thinks about him that Pearsall was on the field as much as he was to begin with, was working as the third receiver, you know, with Jennings out for that game in his NFL debut coming off the gunshot wound. So Niners believe in him. So there's upside in an upside situation. Tampa Bay has been an upside offense to this point, but they're about to test that because first we lost Mike Evans to a hamstring injury, came into the game with that issue, aggravated it during the game. Sure didn't look like as he was leaving the field, somebody who would be ready to play this coming weekend. But, you know, we'll see about that. More importantly, Chris Godwin went down likely for the season at the very end of that game. So suddenly there's opportunity with a quarterback who leads the league in touchdown passes right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bet that that doesn't continue, that Baker Mayfield isn't nearly as productive the rest of the way, uh, especially in week eight. But Jared, who are the wide receivers to target as the fill-ins here? Like you said, Matt, Godwin's out for the season. Mike Evans, I think he might end up missing multiple games, and we see guys aggravate hamstring injuries, and they tend to miss you know more time than they did originally. I don't even know why Mike Evans played in that game last night, but I guess that, that's a different story. It's the opportunity here. The Bucks right now, third in pass rate over expected. They are ninth in the NFL in pass attempts. They're fifth in passing yards. I, I do think that's going to have to come down when you lose your top wide receiver for the season and then you know your your 1b for potentially multiple weeks but you know still might be a pass leaning offense because the run game just you know hasn't been all that effective at least when it's been Rashad White to me Jalen McMillan is the ad here and I would you know I'd probably rank both 49ers guys ahead of him in priority but McMillan would be a close third for me he was a prospect I liked coming out Jalen McMillan actually saw more targets caught more passes and scored more touchdowns than Roma Dunze in 2022 at Washington McMillan dealt with an 
injury for most of 2023, and that kind of hurt his draft stock. He ended up dropping to the third round of this spring's draft. But I think he's a good player. Hasn't shown much yet this season, but you know, it's tough when you're sharing the field with Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. It's going to be easier to earn targets and produce when you know at least one of those guys is off the field. So McMillan is someone to me again who I think just based on the talent and the opportunity here, you know, he, he could be a guy we're talking about as a weekly wide receiver three in a month from now. Yeah, I think there's potential for like something something like what we've seen from Demario Douglas with the Patriots over his year and a half there, where it's not necessarily an exciting player, but an intriguing player with lots of opportunity available. I think that this team is going to have to lean away from the pass much more than it has to this point, because I don't think it's a matter of we're going to throw the ball because Baker Mayfield's so good. I think it's like we got Baker Mayfield, who's playing pretty well. We've got Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, who obviously we want to lean on. Now they've got at least got the three guys in the backfield who among them can have a respectable run game. They did against Baltimore, you know, the week after the breakthrough for Sean Tucker. So I think we'll see more running, a bit less passing, but plenty of opportunity for Jalen McMillan. Trey Palmer also in the picture, not as good a bet, I think, for regular targets. He's more of a downfield guy. And if he's not, then they're kind of clipping what is his best attribute. So either way, I think Trey Palmer is more of like a stash and see what happens could come into play for non PPR lineups where, you know, the big plays are more important and lower target volumes, less important. Yeah. I think we both kind of liked Palmer as a sleeper in last year's draft class. He had big market shares in his final college season. You know, he was around four three in, in the 40 yard dash fast guy, but he, he was not good as a rookie 14% targets per route as a rookie 0.84 yards per route run. That was 85th among 93 qualifying in his offense. Again, he's sharing the field with Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, so it can be tough. So I'm not throwing in the towel on Trey Palmer quite yet. He obviously has a big opportunity now, but you know, McMillan's already been playing ahead of Palmer, you know, when McMillan was healthy early in the season, and then even this past week. So again, I think McMillan is clearly the better bet to have an impact. But if you can get Palmer for three to five percent of your your fab budget, I think he, he's worth a shot. Yeah, he's you know, again, kind of the fallback if you bid on McMillan, but you get outbid by a league mate. Mm-hmm. The Bucks interestingly have an upside matchup for passing this week with Atlanta, but after that, KC 49ers by and then the Giants, all three of those teams have been negative matchups for wide receiver scoring. So not a great span of games for the Buccaneers passing game. And we'll see how long Mike Evans might be out. Troy Franklin in Denver has seen dramatic increase in his role over the past two games 68.3 percent route participation against the chargers a couple weeks ago 66.7 percent against the saints on thursday night what are you doing with troy franklin if anything now jared yeah behind mcmillan for me in like waiver of priority this week maybe ahead of trey palmer um, i just think franklin potentially a, a better player uh, maybe a, a bit clearer path to targets at this point at least when mike evans is back for tampa i'm not getting overly excited about franklin i think i think he's still the clear number two in denver i know he easily out targeted Cortland sutton who is just invisible and in that there's in that game for some reason but i do think sutton's still gonna be the lead target here and this is a denver team that's 25th in passing yards right now they're 30th in passing touchdowns you do have a rookie quarterback and we're talking talking about a rookie wide receiver. So there's like a chance for both these guys to ascend over the second half of the season. I think that'd probably be the most exciting thing about Franklin is that he should be getting better with each week now, but I still think it's going to be tough for him to be more than like a, a bi-week filler option for at least the rest of this season. And of course he and Bonex came from the same college. So they're familiar with each other to begin with, but yeah, this is a stash. I mean, if you want to stick Troy Franklin on your bench and see what happens, that's fine. I'm not interested in starting a guy who's running two thirds of the routes with Bo Nix right now, because because I need to see the quarterback do more before I can even think about using that wide receiver. You know, we've talked plenty about rookie wide receivers get better over the second half. So, you know, that's why you stash somebody like that on the cheap, see what happens. If nothing happens, you drop them for something else. Or, you know, even if you need that spot for somebody else, that's the kind of player that you can just go ahead and throw back to get what you need. But Troy Franklin worth watching because he has made a noticeable improvement in role to this point, even though we're just now getting to halfway through his rookie season. Trey Tucker, the last guy that we'll talk about among the wide receivers, some volume upside here, but a negative matchup with Kansas city. And then, you know, he's a Raider. Yeah. And the volume upside kind of goes away when Jacoby Myers comes back. I think Myers and Bowers are going to combine for like, you know, 50 ish percent of those teams targets when, once they're both healthy. So I, I don't really see it with Trey Tucker. Again, I think in, in best ball, he's someone that might help you, but in lineup setting leagues, I think he's going to hurt you more often than that. Yeah. I mean, if you're in a deeper league, go ahead and stash him because if you get, have somebody that can get eight targets in a given game, there's a spot for him, but 
that Kansas City matchup's the fifth worst for wide receiver scoring by our adjusted points allowed so far. Neutral matchup in week nine with the Bengals, but then a week 10 bye. So there's not a whole lot to get excited about with Trey Tucker, especially because yeah. Gardner Minshew is his quarterback. You can <laughs> check our week eight waiver wire pickups article for specific bid recommendations, exactly how we slot these wide receivers against each other. And you know, a lot more details on these and the rest of the players. Of course, use your free agent finder to actually see who is the best option available in your league for all of the leagues that you have synced. Tight end help is next up on the list, Jared. Who's your favorite target at this position, assuming that you need somebody either for week eight or the rest of the way? Yeah, it's Hunter Henry pretty easily, actually. And I know we all got rug pulled when he had that big week two and then sort of disappeared for a few games after that. I think the difference now, obviously, is that Drake May is that quarterback for the Patriots and has actually given this Patriots passing game some life. Hunter Henry, it's it's been two straight good performances now. You know, he was tight on seven and then tight on six these last two games. And of course, this past week was more encouraging because of the target volume that Henry got. Henry has a 20% target share now in two games with Drake May. They have Keishon Butte leading the wide receiver core and snapped right now. That tells you all you need to know about the, the Patriots wide receiver. So there, there's a chance for you know Henry to, I think, be right there with Demario Douglas as the top two options in this passing game. And this could be like a league average passing attack with Drake May under center now. Is Hunter Henry going to deliver for you every week? Probably not. But how many tight ends are doing that? Sam Laporte is not. Mark Andrews is not. I mean, George Kittle's now hurt. Travis Kelsey hasn't delivered for us every week. So this is a position where yeah, but I can't count on him every week is just not an argument against the guy. Hunter Henry has produced, as you said, past two weeks good. That big game earlier in the season, the passing game is looking better now that Drake May is in there. And Hunter Henry is plenty available for a guy that you know has shown some signs of life this year. Just 29% rostered on Sleeper, 31% on Yahoo, 27% on ESPN. Interestingly, 57% rostered on CBS. So if you're looking for a tight end on CBS, you might be out of <laughs> luck searching for Hunter Henry. But we've got a couple other options to consider. And next on the list is Janu Smith, who through the first four games this season had just nine total receptions, 78 yards. But the past two weeks has put up 12 catches, 158 yards. Now, of course, we all know that those two games came with replacement quarterbacks who have been underusing Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. We should get more targets for the wideouts when Tua Tonga-Vailoa returns, and the Dolphins are expecting that to happen this week. But... Even the last time the Tua played, Johnny Smith caught all five of his targets for 47 yeah. yards before Tua left that game against the Bills. Tua's return is definitely good news for Johnny Smith, you know, even if it, it hopefully does mean more targets going to the wide receivers. The, the issue with John, and why he, I think he's a really nice stash right now is we sort of wait and see how his role continues to evolve. The issue with you know considering him as a potential week eight fantasy starter is just his role has been all over the place throughout the season. And you look at the fantasy production, he has two top six tight end finishes this season. Now he also has a tight end 16 finish, but he's been outside the top 30 at the position in his other three games. So he's been totally unreliable, but I do like that. You know, Miami coming off the by last week, we got Johnu Smith on a season high 78% route rate. That could be just a one off, and he's going to go back to, you know, 40, 50% again next week. Or it's like the Dolphins used the bye week to figure out that, you know, Johnu Smith probably is our, our third best pass catching option, or I guess maybe fourth best after the wide receivers and Devon A. Chan. And if that's the case, if he's going to be around, you know, 70, 80% routes, then he is someone we can count on on a weekly basis, assuming to have stays healthy at this point going forward. So I would definitely stash Johnu, but try not to use him in lineups this week. Yes, I agree with that. And a similar level, I think, for Noah Fant in Seattle, where we've gotten better numbers the past two weeks from Fant. And two weeks ago, we got a climb to 81% route share back in week six that went back down like rebounded in the wrong direction in week seven to 48 percent route share the second lowest snap total second lowest overall snap share of the season for Noah Fant in that game so that's kind of hidden behind him putting up 10 catches over the past two games the other thing to make sure that you're aware of with Noah Fant I think is that he has caught all 10 of his targets over the past two games and all 21 of his targets over the past five games, a 100% catch rate over that span. So that's not going to continue. I'm going to go out on a limb and say he's not going to catch 100% of his targets the rest of the way. So there's already some built-in fragility to 
what's just been like mildly improved production to this point. Noah Fant, I think, is worth a look this week if you are hunting for a tight end, but make sure that you don't get overexcited about his boost in production the past two weeks. Yeah, to me, Noah Fant's interesting if DK Metcalf misses time with his knee injury because that leaves behind something like 21% of Seattle's targets. And I do think there's a good chance Metcalf misses time. The Seahawks get the Bills this week, the Rams the following week, and then a bye. We could definitely see DK miss these next two games. The Bills, are a neutral matchup for Fant this week. And then he gets a really good matchup against the Rams in week nine. So again, he's a potential short-term option for fantasy teams. I think the one other thing I I, um, noticed about Seattle working through projections for this week is they were the past heaviest offense in the NFL looking at pass rate over expected through the first five weeks of the season they were plus nine percent pass rate over expected the last two weeks they've been negative four percent and then zero percent just totally neutral in terms of pass rate over expected so we've seen them shift away from the pass a bit these last two weeks and again it's the NFL it could just be a two-week thing where based on the opponent or whatever it was they you know moved towards the run or it could be you know they kind of don't want Geno Smith throwing 45 times a game Kenneth Walker's playing really well they're going to be more of a bad balanced offense going forward. And that matters for Fant. That's volume that, that he needs to pay off as a tight end. So that's worth monitoring. Again, it comes down to Matt Calf for me. If, if he, he does miss time, I do think Fant could be a spot starter for these next couple of weeks. One other thing that could especially help Fant this coming week, obviously even more so if Metcalf's out, but I was at that Titans Bills game and there were a lot of Titans tight end receptions in that game. We had Chiga Conquo catch four balls. Nick Vanette caught four balls. Josh Wiley caught three balls. That's 11 receptions by Titans tight ends. Not a strong group of players, not a good quarterback in that game. And there weren't big plays to like grab your attention. But every time I saw a completion, I was like, that's a different tight end. They they just converted another first down to a tight end that I didn't remember what his last name is until they announced it over the PA. So if the Titans can do that kind of at will without a whole lot else to you know, draw your defensive attention. There's certainly room for Noah Fant to potentially have a worthwhile day in that matchup with Buffalo this week. I think the Bills defense generally is just weaker over the middle than on the outside. That's kind of the Sean McDermott defense, I think. And again, looking at our adjusted fantasy points allowed, the Bills are 10th against wide receivers. They're 14th against tight ends. So, you know, not a great matchup for Fant this week, but again, a neutral one, one that you don't have to really be worried about. Anyone else worth grabbing at the position? Nothing else at tight end for me. I did have another wideout I wanted to, to mention probably for or deep leagues, but Cedric Tillman is a guy I, I just kind of liked him coming out of Tennessee. He actually he outproduced Jalen Hyatt in their second to last season at Tennessee, and that probably means less now that Jalen Hyatt's done absolutely nothing in the NFL. But the Tillman, someone I still have some intrigue with. He took over for Amari Cooper last week. He was basically a full time player for that Browns offense, drew a 23% target share. And what's exciting potentially in Cleveland is Jameis Winston taking over a quarterback. Again, that, that's an if. We'll see. You know, it seems like Cleveland might want to look at Dorian Thompson Robinson for whatever reason. And in that case, I would not be too interested in, in Cedric Tillman. But if, if it is Jameis Winston under center, you know, Winston just produces fantasy points for himself, for wide receivers for opposing defenses. It's just fantasy points out there when Winston's on the field. So I think Tillman could be someone who, who's useful in, in deeper leagues uh, the rest of the way here. I think uh, Jameis Winston and Ryan Fitzpatrick might sit one, two in either order in the YOLO quarterback rankings all yeah. time. So yeah, it's rough for Browns fans that you have to say, hey, it's exciting that Jameis Winston's going to be the quarterback maybe. But, you know, it helps us versus what has been there in Cleveland. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be interested. Cedric Tillman, also the son of former NFL wide receiver Cedric Tillman. So, for anybody who's old, that's interesting. <laughs> Streaming defenses to close us out. Week eight, the Chargers might be available, Jared. I checked the mm-hmm. roster rate just to make sure. And they are rostered in only 36% of sleeper leagues right now. The Chargers are home for the Saints this week at Cleveland in week nine, home for Tennessee in week 10. So that's three straight weeks we can use them. I love to pick up a streaming level defense that I can use for multiple weeks because I'm busy during the week and I don't want to have to comb (laughs) the waivers any more than I need to. The Chargers remain the league's top scoring defense. Only one opponent has reached 20 points so far against them and none have exceeded 20 points. Ninth in takeaways, two plus takeaways in three of six games so far. After that three game stretch, I mentioned I could go either way with the Chargers against the Bengals at home against the Bengals in week 11. You know, we'll see when we get to that point after that three straight negative matchups. So certainly by week 12, you're going to want a replacement. The Chargers, you know, with those three upcoming matchups, that's a situation where, again, depending on how deep your wire is and how your roster is shaping up, like I'd be willing to spend like 10 to 12% of my my fab to get them at this point. It depends on your individual situation, but definitely can 
consider that with those three matchups coming up. I think Houston is also a strong streamer this week against the Colts and Anthony Richardson, who continues to struggle. I think Detroit is a really strong streamer. I mean, they, they still played pretty well for most of that game against Minnesota without Aiden Hutchinson. They are home for the Titans this weekend. I think the Lions are like 11 point favorites in that game or something. So it should be way too many Mason Rudolph dropbacks, obviously giving the Lions defense plenty of upside. Or Will Levis. We'll see if that shoulder's ready to let him back on the field this week. Either way. And if you don't have one of those defenses for week nine, I think the Bengals are a potential one week rental. They're at home against the Raiders that week before a, a matchup with Baltimore that you certainly won't want to play the Bengals against. Yeah, we kind of looks tricky to me. There's a lot of like bad defenses playing bad offenses, which can always be tough. I, I do like Tennessee versus New England in week nine. The Titans defense still playing pretty well. And as we talked about, you know, Drake May gives the Patriots passing game upside, but also is going to take sacks, going to turn the ball over. So I think the Titans are a pretty decent streaming option for week nine. Yeah, and then we'll see exactly how you feel about both Drake May and the Titans defense when we get, you know, a week closer to that. Your free agent finder, of course, is waiting with updated projections for this week, for next week, for the rest of the season. So no matter what position you're looking for help with or when you're targeting that help, you'll find what you need for every single team and league that you have synced. The free agent finder is a key example of how draft sharks can be your unfair advantage. 